Okay, so now we're going to shift into the middle childhood years. So we're looking at approximately age 6 to 12. And as always, we'll focus first on the physical and cognitive developmental issues. So your author needs to kind of select certain time periods to talk about issues that are obviously not just related to this time developmental stage, but to many. And obesity is one of those issues. So, um, you know, Laura Burke has chosen the middle childhood years to kind of target and zoom in on some of these issues. But I want you to know that these are not issues just associated with middle childhood, but also throughout the lifespan. As you know, um, obesity certainly has a lot of negative impact. But if we take a look at obe oops, a little too far, obesity issues in um, children, we can see that, um, you know, some of the problems could certainly be a result of the increased use of technology, which results in less playing outside, less physical activity, you know, so there's a lot more television, media, video games, internet, etc. And also with the very busy society um, that we have, we're constantly on the run and our eating habits may not be so good. So we're kind of doing that fast food drive through at McDonald's much more frequently than we should be. And all these issues certainly can impact um, the health of our children. So this is a very important issue. I know um, you probably have heard about some you know, federal initiatives, you know, um, you know, Michelle um, Obama has really kind of done a lot, quite a bit on um, trying to get children up and moving and getting them more active. And you'll see in this chapter, there's also a section on recess and the importance of recess and why we really need to keep it. And it's actually not just about the physical benefits, but also there are certainly emotional um, and social benefits of recess as well. If we do look at the physical growth, though, you'll see um, that we're going to revisit gross and fine motor skill development once again. Um, if you go to, um, you know, your neighborhood park or a little lake field or um, anything like that, you will see a giant, giant shift from the early childhood years to the middle childhood years. You know, in Little League, for instance, it goes from playing fetch where they're going to run after the ball to actually the, the ball falling into their glove and, and actually being able to make some catches and being able to hit the ball farther, being able to kick the ball farther with soccer. Um, you know, gymnasts having much more agility and flexibility. So if you just take a look at the gross motor skills, they really are taking off in a, in a very significant way. Same is true for fine motor skills. Um, it goes from, you know, drawings that were um, at least recognizable to drawings that are much more sophisticated. You know, their handwriting becomes much um, easier to read. They're able to write in smaller spaces because, again, the fine motor skills have really um, taken off the ground during the uh, middle childhood years. Okay, we're back on cognitive development. So, of course, we're going to talk about Piaget once again. And for the... Um, this middle childhood age range, we're focusing on concrete operational period. Piaget actually says at 7 to 11, so it's right in our middle childhood years. And now we are going to talk about skills that they do have. So you'll recall that that concept of conservation was a, was a skill that they did not develop in the pre-operational period. Um, and that conservation task was, you know, that the water beakers had the same amount of water even though you moved it, things of that nature. So their skills are now significantly increasing. One of the best um, cognitive uh, tools that develop is the ability to classify or use hierarchies and you can see over here I have a picture of seashells children during this stage like to collect things and um, organize them in, in a variety of different ways and that's because it's really a new cognitive toy that they have this ability to classify so if they're going to classify seashells they might do it by color they might do it by size they might do it by shape um, they might collect other things baseball cards um, they might organize it by team, by, by um, alphabetical order, by position. So basically this ability to classify in these hierarchies is a very, very um, new and important skill. Um, it's a skill you need every day as you're studying and taking in new information. So it will make it a lot easier for them to take in and process information. In addition, they also have seriation and spatial reasoning, so their number um, skills are certainly increasing and their ability to see and perceive things in space and the connection to other things are going to significantly increase as well. If we take a look at their memory, it's not surprising that their strategies are going to improve because they just got these new cognitive toys, um, you know, such as classification. 
Um, they're going to use skills like rehearsal, organization, which organization means mentally organizing, so they're making connections between concepts. And then elaboration means that they're able to say more about something and make maybe a personal connection or an example of a concept. And all of these skill sets are going to significantly increase the likelihood of um, students holding on to the information that they're learning. So these are powerful cognitive skills that they're um, getting and using. Now we're going to talk about the concept of intelligence. Um, there's two key theorists. I'm just going to pop all these up onto the screen real quick that I want to talk about. Um, intelligence is an interesting concept, and um, there certainly are IQ tests out there that are individually administered and standardized, and um, many of them focus a little bit more on the school smarts. So Sternberg and Gardner actually have a couple of other theories of intelligence that I want to draw your attention to. Um, Sternberg is the person who is focused on the triarchic theory. So he developed this theory of intelligence where there are um, three main types of intelligence. Um, we have analytical, creative, and practical. And basically, you know, he would say that the analytical piece is a little bit more about school smart stuff, but it is really about can you take in, analyze, use information, apply it, um, you know, put it into practice somehow. So are you able to kind of take information and do something with that information, analyze and use? That's one piece. The creative piece are um, folks who kind of think outside of the box. So they're not just... Um, going to look at um, traditional ways of solving problems, but they're going to be able to think about new or different ways to solve problems. And, um, you know, we all know that there are some folks that are really, really good at, um, you know, creative problem solving. So it's not necessarily creative in the sense that we're creating music and art and other things of that nature, which certainly may play a role here, but it's really kind of more a cognitive creation that um, Sternberg focuses on. And then the third one is the practical one. Um, and basically, he says that in order for intelligence to be useful, we need to make practical use of it. So, um, you know, this is kind of a, a little bit of a common sense kind of approach to intelligence, but really being able to take information and use it in some way that is productive. So... Um, some folks are really pretty skilled at that, and, and what he says is kind of being able to use all of these skills um, together is what makes for somebody who's going to be pretty successful at using intelligence to their advantage. Now, Howard Gardner has a different approach. His theory is called multiple intelligences, and um, both Sternberg and Gardner want everyone to take a much broader view of intelligence than just thinking about school smarts and think about it in a much more um, societal kind of way. And Gardner, as you can see, has eight different types of intelligence. And he basically says that no one type is more important than another. You know, the first several, verbal, mathematics, spatial, those are a little bit more, um, you know, kind of connected to school. But there are many other um, intelligences, and he says we need to equally value all of those. So, um, for instance, the interpersonal, inter means between, these are folks who are really good at um, working well with others, judging, you know, kind of picking up on cues and nuances to understand what others might be thinking, and that really helps them engage um, easily with them. Um, intrapersonal is when you are, intra means within, so you're really good at just judging your own strengths, weaknesses, and um, kind of thinking through, engaging in self-reflection and things of that nature. Um, some of the others are fairly, you know, obvious bodily kinesthetic is more being able to use your body in a purposeful, effective way. So um, use, uh, I would say like it could be like gymnasts or any kind of athletic kind of person would be an example of that. So um, I want you to get familiar with the um, concept of intelligence, but also the different types of intelligence. Um, one other issue I wanted to bring to your attention is um, your author doesn't actually spend that much time on this topic, but I think it's a pretty important topic. And it has to do with students who may have special needs. The most common type of disability is a learning disability, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there about learning disabilities, so I'm going to just make sure you have a good understanding of what a learning disability is. It, um, it is a person who has um, average to above average intelligence, yet is not achieving to that level. 
um, for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, maybe in reading, writing, or math, they, their, their ability is high, but their performance is not. So it's kind of a discrepancy. We can see this visually here. Um, this is the bell curve, um, which illustrates kind of what's normal. Um, if we look at IQ test scores, the average IQ is right here in the center, just like any other um, factor that we would look at. And average IQ is actually 190 to 109 is the average range. So let's just assume that the person has average to above average IQ, but their achievement is over here. So you can see there's a discrepancy. So that's how it's visualized. Um, but I did want to bring your attention to some really amazing research that's being done out there. Um, Dr. Sally Shaywitz has been using functional MRIs um, to really study dyslexia or reading disabilities, which is the most prevalent type of um, learning disability. And it's kind of amazing what she has found. Um, she's found that different folks are using different parts of their brain depending on what their reading skills are. So um, if we look at skilled readers for a minute, so these are folks who are really good at reading. They're using the occipital temporal lobe um, to read. And if you recall from the biology chapter or your intro to psych days, the occipital lobe is the lobe that really targets vision. So what they're doing is they're actually looking at, at words as packages. They're kind of seeing it as a whole entity. Where on the other hand, the dyslexic readers are not really using this part of their brain so much and instead they're using more of the Broca's area and here they have to actually break down the word. So they're not recognizing the word um, cat as a package, C-A-T. Instead, they're breaking down each sound by itself, at, in order to get the word cat into their system. Now the most interesting part of her research is, is that if you teach students phonics, which is the sound, the breakdown part, so the students who are um, having trouble reading, they can actually be trained to use the more efficient, um, better parts of their brain through this process. So it's really kind of some neat research I just wanted to share with you that goes a little bit above and beyond what's in your textbook. All right, so those are the um, issues I wanted to highlight in this chapter. There's clearly some other very important ones, so I hope you enjoy reading the rest of the chapter.